Turn your Bibles, if you will. We're going to be in the book of Genesis, chapter 45. Genesis, chapter 45. And as you're turning there again, we've been on the subject of forgiveness. How do cows, bovine cows, forgive each other? They turn the utter cheek. The utter cheek, Charlie. Amen. Last week, we began to consider how to apply Joseph's incredible example of forgiveness to our own lives. You see, just knowing that we need to forgive, just knowing that we ought to forgive, falls way short of actually forgiving our offender, doesn't it? We have to apply it. And this morning, I want to continue to outline the seven steps that we must take in order to truly forgive our offenders as God forgives us. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave us. Amen? So the first thing that we saw was that the first step is that we don't let anyone know what happened to us. Amen? Genesis chapter 45, verse 1. Then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried out, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with Joseph while he made himself known to his brothers. Joseph had every potential witness sent out. Amen? Why? Because he wanted to to make sure that no one would ever know what his brothers did to him. He forgave them the same way that God forgives us. God chooses not to remember our sins. Amen? He chooses to cast them and bury them in his sea of forgetfulness. No one will ever know the sins that we've committed if we're a child of God. Amen? No one will ever know because God will never reveal them to anyone. But in our sin nature, we want to tell anyone who will listen, don't we? Anyone who will listen to what happened to us. We want revenge. We want payback. We want to hurt that person's reputation for what they did to us. Our tongue is our most powerful and most used weapon. But we need to understand that forgiveness is a bridle for our tongue. Amen? We are not to tell anyone what happened to us. That's step number one. Step number two is that we don't allow anyone to be afraid or intimidated by us. We don't want, we don't allow our offender to be intimidated by us. Skip down to verse 2. And Joseph wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his very presence. Joseph's desire, his true heart's desire, was for his brothers to be at peace. He wanted them to be comforted. The last thing that he wanted was for them to fear him. Now, our desire, again, in the flesh, our desire to have those who hurt us be afraid of us or or be intimidated by us is a sign that we still have what? Anger and bitterness in our hearts. How do we know that? The Bible tells us in 1 John 4, 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment, intimidation, fear. All those things are torment. We cannot allow bitterness to take root and to replace the love of Jesus Christ that is in our heart. Amen? We can't allow it to take root and replace that love. Joseph, in his example here, his life, he showed us what true forgiveness should look like. Amen? Third step is also we want them to forgive themselves and not feel guilty. 
verse 4, Genesis 45. And Joseph said to his brothers, again, he saw the fear in their face. They were dismayed at his presence. And he said to his brothers, please come near to me. So they came near. Then he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. But, he said, now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. We have to understand that Joseph never forgot what happened to him. Joseph never pretended that that nothing happened. But he also knew the guilt that his brothers were carrying. He could see it on their very faces. And he didn't want to add to it. He didn't want them to, to blame themselves. What did he ultimately want? He wanted them to forgive themselves so that they didn't feel guilty. He wanted them to be set free. The same desire that God has for us with his forgiveness. Amen? He wants us to know without a shadow of a doubt that we are saved and our sins are covered by the blood of Christ. He wants us to know that we have been set free. Amen? He wants us to know that all things work together for the good to them that love him. How many things? All things. Good and bad. Amen? Good and evil. All those things, all those situations, all those circumstances in our life are all for our good. It's for our benefit. He has turned our gloom into glory. He has turned our heartaches into hallelujahs. And we need to do the same to those who hurt us. Amen? Step four. We will let them save face. What does save face mean? It means we're going to allow them to avoid embarrassment. Amen? Let them save face. Let's get back to our original text in in, uh, Genesis 45. Skip down to verse 7. He said, God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Joseph told his brothers the truth that we are not able to understand until God reveals his forgiveness to our heart. Amen? The truth that Joseph told his brothers here is something that we can't understand until we are the recipients of God's forgiveness. Amen? What did he say to them? He said, you didn't do this to me. God had this plan. God had this purpose for me all along. So we need to understand that saving face is not only refusing to let them feel guilty, It's also showing them that God's purposes, God's plans for us are above any of our actions. Amen? And the actions of those around us. Plain and simple. He's working out the situation into something good for us no matter what's going on all around us. In essence... It's covering their sin from others so they won't feel ashamed. Amen? So they won't feel embarrassed. That's what saving face is all about. And this is what God does with our past as well, doesn't he? Amen? He allows us to save face. I want to show you a great example. Go to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. I want to read a verse to you that you've probably read multiple times, but I want to show you something in it. Verse 6, Matthew 1, verse 6. This is, Matthew 1 is the genealogy of Christ. Amen? In verse 6, 
it says, And Jesse begot David the king. David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Did you hear that? David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. We're all very familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba, who was the wife of who? Uriah. But when you read this genealogy of Christ here, we would almost think that this was God's plan all along, wouldn't we? The way that God worded it here. You almost believe that this was God's plan, his purpose, all along for David. But I can guarantee you this, it absolutely was not. Amen? It absolutely was not God's plan. His sin of adultery led to just lie after lie. It led to deception after deception and even led to murder. It's one of the worst sins in the history of God's people. Amen? So we can be rest assured that was not God's plan for David. However, when we read this uh, verse 6 in Matthew 1, God is saving face for David and making it sound like it was supposed to happen this way. Amen? Now getting back to, to Joseph and his brothers, imagine the look on his brothers' faces when he helped them save face. He said, you didn't send me here. God did. Confused, they they must have thought, how is that possible? We know what we did to you. That can't be possible. Joseph explains further. He said, look, God's plans, his, his purpose was for the Jews to live in Egypt and be spared as a remnant. He said, somebody had to go first, and God just happened to choose me. Amen? God knew about the coming famine. There's no doubt about it. He was the one who revealed the dream, the vision to Pharaoh in the first place. Nothing surprises God. Amen? We have to understand that. These seven years of incredible famine didn't surprise God. He warned them it was coming. And he had a plan already in place to preserve Jacob and his entire family. Why? Because they just happened to be the patriarchs of the nation of Israel. Amen. This was God's plan. That was his ultimate purpose. So instead of condemning them, Joseph trusted God. Amen. And he reached an understanding of their actions in a way that they could save face. When we truly forgive from our heart, we have to understand that there is no room for acting self-righteous. Amen? We need to accept the fact that under the same circumstances, because of our sin nature, we have the propensity to do the same exact thing. Amen? There's two main reasons why we are able to forgive. The first is that we see and that we are fully aware of all that God has forgiven us of. Amen? All of, that, all of the sins that God has forgiven us of. And the second reason is that we also see and that we're fully aware of all that we are capable of doing. Amen? Not only are we aware of the sins we have committed, but we are also aware of the sins that we are capable of of committing. Amen? When we are indignant, when we are appalled, when we're offended by other sins, what does that say? All that says is that we are full of self-righteousness. Amen? We're full of self-righteousness. We're not being true to our own failures. We're not being true to our own sins or to what we are truly capable of doing ourselves. Every single one of us, because of our sin nature, 
because we are still wrapped in this flesh, we are all capable to commit any sin. King David is that perfect example, amen? David was full of faith. David was a man of God. And yet he committed murder, committed adultery. Sin after sin after sin. We are all capable of committing any sin. Amen? We all have that same propensity to sin. And we can't put ourselves up on that high horse. We have to be very careful not to put ourselves up on that pedestal and start pointing fingers at, at someone else's sin. I'd never do that. You know, I'd never uh, let that happen. That's just self-righteousness. Amen. You see, that's what young Joseph was full of when he was younger. That's what made him a tattletale. Amen. Isn't that what a tattletale is? You did this, but I never would. I'm going to go tell dad or mom. He had self-righteousness in his heart when he was a young man. That was one of the things God had to work on him with. We need to all understand that we are simply saved only by the intervening grace of God by our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Saved by his grace alone. But praise God, Joseph was not self-righteous any longer. Amen. He was no longer that tattletale of his youth. God had opened his spiritual eyes. God had changed and molded his heart. God had molded him into the image of Christ. One other thing about Joseph. He didn't desire the admiration of being so gracious to his brothers. Amen. He didn't do it as a show. We know that why? He chased everybody out. He didn't want anybody to see. He had no desire for admiration for for his graciousness. He'd completely forgiven his brothers during that time in jail, during that time that God worked on his heart. He allowed God to do that work. And God made him a glowing example of forgiveness for all of us to follow. Amen. Praise God for that example. In letting his brothers save face, Joseph was saying, by faith, he was saying, God truly sent me to Egypt for a divine purpose. He was saying, I'm no better than any of my brothers. He's saying, I now know that the lies and the hurt and the pain and the suffering, it is now worth it. God indeed meant it all for my good. Amen. By faith, he could absolutely say that and mean it from the bottom of his heart. John chapter 16, verse 20. Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say to you that you will weep and lament, but the world will rejoice, and you will be sorrowful, But your sorrow will be turned into joy. Amen. He said, a woman, when she is in labor, has sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for the joy that a human being has been born into the world. Therefore, you now have sorrow, but I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will will take from you. Amen. Fifth step. We will protect them from their greatest fear. What's our greatest fear? That we're going to have to fess up what we did to somebody. Amen. Right? So when Joseph had forgiven his brothers, they were relieved beyond measure. The problem is it didn't last. It didn't last very long. For their greatest fear began to creep in. How in the world could they return to their father 
and tell him the truth about what they did to Joseph, his favorite son. How in the world could they fess up to their father? The truth about his blood-stained coat. The truth about all their lies and all their deception. And, oh, by the way, they also needed to convince him to leave his home in Canaan, pack everything up, and move to Egypt, where the son he thought was dead just happened to be prime minister. Quite a task. But what happens next is one of the most beautiful, most moving events in the life of Joseph. Skip down to verse 9. Genesis 45, verse 9. Listen to what Joseph says to them. He says, hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me and do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near to me, you and your children and your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest you and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks this to you. So you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. You see what Joseph did? Joseph spared them from facing their fear. They were to tell their father the truth, but only the amount of truth that he needed to know. Amen. He didn't want them to lie to him, but he also didn't want them to tell the whole story. Just tell him enough truth to get him here and I'll fill in the gaps. God does the same for us. Our sins, covered under the blood of Jesus Christ, do not need to be confessed to anyone. Amen? Praise God for that. Psalm 51, verse 4. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Did you catch that? Who do we sin against first and foremost? God. Amen? We only need to confess our sins to him. And we know that he will never blackmail us with our greatest fear. And neither should we to our offender. Amen? Joseph was loving. He was gracious. And he was fair. And it made his brothers respect him even more. Amen. When I think about all the sins that I've been forgiven of, it's enough to keep my mouth closed forever. Amen. Plain and simple. Step number six. It's a lifelong commitment. We have to keep doing it until our very last breath. Amen. Amen. We cannot forgive today, then bring it up tomorrow. Amen? We can't forgive today and then bring up the offense tomorrow. That's not forgiveness. For Joseph, he and his father Jacob, they were re uh, reunited with the rest of the family in Egypt. However, 17 years later, his father dies, Jacob dies. His brothers begin to panic. Why? Because they feared that, that Joseph's forgiveness was only good as long as their father was alive. Fear began to creep back into their hearts. Let's go to Genesis chapter 50. Skip down to verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead... They said, perhaps Joseph will hate us and may actually repay us for all the evil which we did to him. I believe this is something that we can all relate to. We can all 
understand their fear. Amen? Why? Because the forgiveness that we're used to, the forgiveness that we normally get and give is not complete. Amen? It's not lasting. We're used to others keeping a a record of our wrongs and then throwing it back in our face sometime down the road again. Amen? That's the kind of forgiveness that we're used to. So out of fear, his brothers make up a story. Verse 16. So they sent messengers to Joseph saying, Before your father died, he commanded this, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, I beg you, please forgive the trespass of your brothers and their sin, for they did evil to you. Now please forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. You see, if this had been true, Jacob, his father, he would have told him. Amen? That was tradition in those days. Jacob would absolutely have pulled his son aside and made this request of him if it were true. When Joseph heard it, he knew they were lying, and he wept. He was hurt. He was heartbroken. Not that they lied, but that they doubted his forgiveness. It broke his heart. Skip down to verse 19. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, in order to bring it about as it is this day, to save many people alive. Now, therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them, and he spoke kindly to them. You see, the forgiveness that Joseph offered 17 years earlier was complete forgiveness, was true forgiveness, and it still applied to them today, tomorrow, and forever. He meant it from his heart. He sincerely wanted to care for them and their families indefinitely, as long as he had breath in his lungs. He was saying, you look, I forgave you then, I still forgive you now, and I will always forgive you. Joseph's changed heart was not temporary, and neither is true forgiveness. Amen. Again, none of these are easy to do, but they're absolutely necessary as a born-again believer. Amen? Bitterness and anger, they crave in our flesh to creep back in. Our mind will replay what happened to us over and over and over again, doesn't it? When we're hurt, when somebody hurts us or, or someone that we love, our mind will replay that over and over and over. And then the enemy, Satan will come along and, and he will constantly whisper in our ear and remind us what they did to us. Remind us that we deserve revenge. And then what happens? We get angry and bitter all over again. It's a vicious cycle. The thought that they're getting away with what they did to us, it just agitates us to no end, doesn't it? This is when we have to step back. This is when we have to stop and just remind ourselves, how does God forgive me? How much has God forgiven me of? We just have to remind ourselves that God forgives us, wipes our slate clean as if we never sinned in the first place. Remind ourselves how his mercies are renewed upon us every morning and how those mercies 
keep that slate clean. Amen. They keep our sins buried in his sea of forgetfulness. When we offer true and complete forgiveness, we must renew that forgiveness tomorrow and the day after and the day after and the day after and the day after. I think we get it, right? It's never ending. Amen. The last step, and we'll close with this. We're going to pray for them to be blessed. Amen. Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. We are to pray that God deal with them the same way that we want him to deal with us. Amen? That is the golden rule, Matthew 7, 12. Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them. Amen? That is God's golden rule. I want you to think back in Acts chapter 7. We're all familiar with Stephen, the first martyr, right? The first Christian martyr. In Acts 7, when we read about that, when Stephen was being stoned to death, he was being stoned to death for his faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Anybody remember his prayer? He prayed, he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Amen? He said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. In his last breath, he forgave them, and not only that, what else did he do? He was asking God to do what? Forgive them. Amen? He forgave them, and he prayed that God would do the same. These are the seven steps to offer true forgiveness. Amen? In your bulletin, I included those seven steps, and I want you to keep them. Keep them as a reminder. Check them off one by one to know that you have completely forgiven that offender of yours. Amen? And they must stay checked off. We can't check them off today and then tomorrow backtrack. Once you check them off, they have to stay checked off. In closing, I want to just add a, a thought of caution. Never go to that person who hurt you and tell them, I've forgiven you. Amen? Remember what I said earlier in our study? Most people, they don't know or they don't feel that they've done anything wrong. So when you go to them and you tell them, I forgive you, all that's going to do is stir up more agitation. Amen? That's just going to stir up the pot. They're going to become resentful and agitated with you. Bottom line is that we are to forgive from the heart and keep quiet about it. Amen? Just forgive and keep quiet about it. The same thing that our Lord and Savior does for us. Amen? He forgives us and he doesn't tell anyone what happened. And we have to do the same.